Should we get started? All right. Yeah, I think we're going to get started. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Claire de la Calle, PGY5 at UCSF. Um, this is Dr. Elliot. Thank you so much for being here today uh, to talk about urethral strictures, and I'll um, help moderate questions at the end. Thank you, Claire. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me from your homes, I suppose. I'm, I'm at home, too. It's lunchtime at the Elliott household, so if you hear uh, people running around grabbing lunch, uh, just forgive us. Uh, I'm going to talk about the AUA guidelines on male anterior urethral stricture. So there's later going to be a talk on pelvic fracture urethral injury. I'm not going to cover that. Uh, I'm going to focus on anterior urethral stricture. I won't cover strictures after prostate cancer treatment, vesicourethral and astomotic strictures, or radiation strictures. There are guidelines on that, but uh, for this 45-minute talk, we'll just focus on anterior strictures. Uh, there, there's one relevant disclosure on the PI of Robust 3, which is a randomized trial of a drug-coated balloon for urethral stricture, but I'm not going to talk about that at all during this guidelines talk. Now, the AUA guidelines in general uh, use the level of evidence to then inform the grade of recommendation. I don't want to get into the weeds on this. The only thing I'd really point out is this language over here that we tried to use consistently, at least in the stricture guidelines, which is that if it's a strong recommendation, we use the language, the surgeon must do something, and softer would be the surgeon should do something, and then softest would be, it's really up to you, you may do something. And then I've organized this talk uh, anatomically. So we're gonna come back to this diagram again and again, uh, as we march through the talk, where we'll talk first about bulbar strictures that are short, less than two centimeters, first time strictures versus recurrent, and then we'll march down this uh, algorithm uh, throughout the talk. Um, and as we work our way through, the, the, the language of the guidelines, word for word, is always going to be down here in this bullet, and then kind of a, a, a brief interpretation from my perspective is sometimes up in the slide here at the top. And uh, the first guideline is clinicians should use urethrocystoscopy, retrograde urethrogram, VCUG, or ultrasound to make a diagnosis of urethral stricture. So what this is saying is that to diagnose a stricture, a lot of different ways work, and just use whatever method works best for you. Uh, so you've diagnosed a urethral stricture, what's next? Um, and let's do, let's get right to doing a poll. Uh, pardon me while there's a, there's uh, a, there's something in the middle of my screen that I need to move because I can't see. You guys probably don't see it. There it goes. Okay, uh, so this poll is a clinical question about a 25 year old man with a long history of slow stream. Uh, he's had no previous treatments, his Qmax is 4, his PVR is 200, his AUA symptom score is 12. So what would be your next step? Would you dilate in the office right now? Would you take them to the OR and do either a balloon dilation or a DVIU? Would you do a rug VCUG? Or would you do an anastomotic urethroplasty? I believe you got 30 seconds to put your responses in. Yeah, so 90% um, of people said they would do a rugby CUG, and uh, that's exactly what the guidelines would recommend. Uh, so basically, there's a difference between diagnosing a stricture and staging a stricture. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, it's hard to know how long this stricture is based off of this cystoscopy. So you'd want to uh, stage it by measuring how long the stricture is. So the guideline says that clinicians planning non-urgent intervention, and this guy we just went over was non-urgent. He was in your office. His AUA symptom score was rather mild to moderate, and he wasn't in retention. So clinicians planning non-urgent intervention for a known stricture 
should determine the length and location of the urethral stricture. Uh, and so you should stage the stricture before you treat it. The guidelines don't tell you how to stage it, so it really leaves it open to you to use whatever method gives you the information you need. Most of us diagnose the stricture with cystoscopy, and honestly, sometimes that's enough to stage it too. So if you look at the cysto image on the top there, you can see the beginning of the stricture and you can see the end of the stricture. You can even see the sphincter back there. So you have enough information to say that this is a, you know, proximal to mid bulbar urethral stricture that's less than one centimeter in length. And you can estimate the size of the lumen in the center of the stricture. And I don't think that you need any imaging really to uh, proceed with treatment. You've got everything you need. But in the second example down below, you've got a, a tight enough stricture that you don't really know how long it is. You might be able to make some estimate of where in the bulbar urethra it is, uh, but sometimes you're off. Uh, but the most important thing is you don't know how long it is. And so when you do a retrograde urethrogram, it could turn out looking like the image on the top, or it might look like on the image on the bottom. And in the non-urgent situation, you really wanna know which of those two it is, because it can really inform what type of treatment you recommend to the patient. Um, and this is one of the few, you know, well done randomized trials in the reconstruction literature, uh, where uh, this group back in the 90s in South Africa randomized patients to DVIU or dilation for urethral strictures and then followed them out for several years and measured the success rate. And the success really depends on the length of the stricture. So short strictures with DVIU or dilation have a success rate of about 60% a few years later, whereas longer strictures have a lower success rate. So if I'm the clinician uh, counseling the patient about which treatment we should uh, pursue, I'm gonna wanna know how long that stricture is before uh, we talk about which treatment so that I can give him an accurate assessment of what the chances of success are. Now, what if it's urgent? Uh, if the treatment is urgent, really do whatever you have to do. Uh, don't worry about the staging. Uh, and the methods you have available to you are dilation, DVIU, SP tube. And what do we mean by urgent? That's uh, maybe someone who's in acute retention, in your office or in the ER or someone who needs a catheter for another surgery, they're already under anesthesia, about to have a coronary artery bypass maybe and they can't get the catheter in. You don't want to wake him up and do a rug BCUG and counsel him about the risks and benefits of the multiple treatment options. You just need to do what needs to be done. And so go ahead and do whatever works for you. It doesn't matter if the long-term success of dilation of a four centimeter stricture is low, you just need to get a catheter in. Uh, next uh, is a statement about treatment of the urethral strictures, specifically those that are short, less than two centimeters. And it says that surgeons may offer urethral dilation, DVIU, or urethroplasty for the initial treatment of short bulbar urethral strictures. Uh, and again, if it's not urgent, you want to stage them first. And what this is getting at is that new short bulbar strictures respond well to all treatments. Uh, and there have not been a lot of comparative studies between endoscopic means and urethroplasty. So what we go off is a, a cost risk benefit analysis done by Hunter Wessel's group, which shows that for a new stricture, that's less than two centimeters, even though the success rate of urethroplasty is higher, like 90% compared to DVIU dilation, which is like 60%, the risks and cost of urethroplasty are also higher. So in the balance, uh, you uh, would actually often do an, a DVIU or dilation based on cost ri risk benefit, uh, but understanding that it's gonna have a lower success rate. What it comes down to again is staging first so that you can give people the correct assessment of the risks and benefits of each approach. So let's say that the patient decides on an endoscopic treatment. 
Um, how do you decide between DVIU and dilation? Well, again, going back to this randomized trial back in the 90s, DVIU and dilation, it turns out, have about similar effectiveness out to four years. So we consider them to be pretty equivalent and surgeons may perform either dilation or DVIU when performing endoscopic treatment of a urethral stricture. Notice the guidelines don't tell you uh, a stricture in a particular location or a particular length. This is just in general saying that if you're trying to decide between the two, you can go with either one. Now, anytime you do a uh, endoscopic dilation or DVIU, you wanna know when can you safely remove the catheter. Some people will leave no catheter, some people will leave it for a week. And when we reviewed the evidence, there wasn't really uh, clear evidence of a particular time period where it would be safe. So in the end, what we said is that you can remove the catheter at least uh, 72 hours or later, we can definitely say is safe. We saw uh, no reported complications across the literature. Notice that some studies even removed the catheters after one or two days of catheterization, but the guidelines panel didn't feel confident that uh, they would recommend the 24 or 48 hour window. Now, what about uh, self-dilation? Does that help improve the long-term success of DVIU or dilation. And this is the only other area in the urethral reconstruction literature where we have a really well-performed uh, randomized trial. We actually have two of them. And the outcomes are that in a stricture that fails DVIU dilation, self-dilation can lengthen the time between endoscopic treatments. Um, but urethroplasty remains the better option for someone who has failed a dilation DVIU if the patient's able to do that. So um, we don't recommend that you should perform self-dilation after a DVIU or, or dilation to maintain urethral patency, but a clinician may do it. And you have to use your own best judgment based on whether uh, this is a patient who's never going to be a good candidate for urethroplasty, so you want to try to make the DVIU dilation work for as long as possible, uh, or whether you just want to give it one shot with the DVIU dilation and, and not do the self-dilation and then see how it turns out and then proceed to urethroplasty. Now, the two studies in question are interesting to look at one at a time. The, the top one there, um, they randomized people to uh, DVIU versus DVIU plus self-dilation for a year. And at the end of that one year, those who just had a DVIU had a 25% success rate, and those who were still doing dilation had an 80% success rate. So based off of that trial, you might say, well, dilation prevents scar tissue from coming back. However, the other randomized trial at the bottom there they, uh, they kind of did the next step in the logic in terms of studies, and they had one group that got a DVIU and the other that had a DVIU plus self-dilation for just three months, and then they looked at the success rate at the end of a year, and there you see the two success rates turn out to be equivalent at one year. So it seems that while they're doing the self-dilation, at least out to a year, it helps keep the stricture open, but once you stop doing the self-dilation, the strictures will recur. And we don't recommend it for everybody because self-dilation is uncomfortable. Uh, Dr. Mori has this uh, retrospective study of, uh, of, of patients who are on self-dilation who presented to his clinic and measured quality of life. And the predictors of poor quality of life were those with younger age, more proximal stricture and difficulty passing the catheter. So that makes sense. If you've got a, if you're just dilating the urethral meatus, that's going to be more comfortable than trying to dilate a proximal bulbar stricture. Uh, similarly, younger men are going to put up with it a lot less than uh, older men, most likely. Uh, there's something in the literature, in the urethral reconstruction literature, called urethral rest. The question is when you've got someone who's gonna have a planned urethroplasty, should you uh, put their urethra at rest before doing the urethroplasty? Uh, 
there's a couple ways to define urethral rest. Some people say urethral rest just means not having any other procedures like self-dilation for a period of a month or two before urethroplasty. I think almost all of us can agree that that's true. You shouldn't be self-dilating in a couple of weeks before the treatment. There's another type of urethral rest, which is should you put in a suprapubic tube so that he's not voiding under high pressure through the stricture, which does a little bit of kind of like hydro distension of the stricture. Uh, because we will find that when we do the urethroplasty, there can be some inflammation around the area of the stricture, and maybe that's from high pressure voiding. So there's one study actually out of, out of our institution that showed that if you place a suprapubic tube, uh, it will make the uh, subsequent x-rays of the stricture show that the stricture gets longer by about a centimeter, and that probably has to do with this hydrodistension. So the guidelines are that surgeons may place a suprapubic cystostomy to before urethroplasty. Um, and especially in these patients who have an indwelling catheter or on intermittent self-dilation. So that takes us to the end of the short bulbar strictures presenting for the first time. These people can have a DVIU or a dilation or urethroplasty. And because it's a short, urethra, uh, short urethral stricture, uh, that urethroplasty is usually going to be some type of an end-to-end -end repair. Uh, so that leads us to our next audi audience response question. You have a 45-year-old man who's six months status post DVIU with a, a flow rate of 10 cc's per second and a PVR of 75. His AUA symptom score is 13 and his quality of life is 4. What would be your next step? Observation, self-dilation, uh, dilation in the OR or clinic, DVIU, or urethroplasty? And so uh, the guidelines would agree with the majority of you, which is that 61% of you said urethroplasty. Uh, I see another popular option was observation. Uh, and I, I imagine that's based off of his AUA symptom score, which is not bad, and his quality of life, which is decent. Uh, he has a low flow rate, but he's emptying his bladder. I don't think anyone would argue with observation as another totally reasonable option, except for the fact that he's 45 and and uh, you'd have to counsel him about some of the long-term risks of uh, living with a stricture like this for, for a long period of time, especially given how tight it looks like on the x-ray. So that takes us to our next guideline statement, uh, which has to do with recurrent urethral strictures. So now we've covered uh, first-time bulbar strictures. Now we're gonna cover recurrent strictures. And because the guideline deals with them the same, whether they're less than or greater than two centimeters, there's just one guideline statement about that, which is that surgeons should offer urethroplasty instead of en repeat endoscopic management for recurrent anterior urethral strictures following failed DVIU or dilation. And this is based off of the, the same uh, Haynes and Steenkamp series from the 1990s. And you can see that the success rate of endoscopic management goes down with each successive round of endoscopic management. So we should inform patients that there's a higher success rate with urethroplasty for recurrent strictures of any length in any location, and they should at least be offered urethroplasty. Uh, many patients will decline it and they'll say, the risks aren't worth it to me, I want another chance at DVIU dilation. That's fine, and that's why the guidelines panel didn't go so far as to say that we should, we should do a urethroplasty or that we must do a urethroplasty. They just said patients should at least be offered a urethroplasty. And now what if no one in my practice does urethroplasty? Uh, there is a guideline statement about that, which is that surgeons who do not perform urethroplasty should offer patients 
referral to surgeons with expertise. Uh, this is a, another paper by Wessels uh, uh, and Figler, which if you want to read it sometime is pretty interesting. This figure is pretty cool looking. It shows you the volumes of urethroplasty done in different centers around the country and what the ratio of endoscopic management to urethroplasty is in that region uh, with the interesting concept that if the ratio is more urethroplasties, then more people are following those uh, guidelines and sending people over for urethroplasty. So which type of urethroplasty would be best for a short bulbar stricture? Uh, there's not great evidence to tell you which would be the best. There was a time when people would say that all of the, everybody with a short bulbar stricture should get excision and primary anastomosis. Uh, but Rich Santucci's published equally good results with a buckle graft for short bulbar strictures. And a lot of us have moved towards uh, some type of a stricturoplasty operation. So this is not guidelines, uh, but my current practice is uh, in everybody with a short bul bulbar stricture, I'll make, as long as it's not a, a transected urethra from a straddle injury, I'll make a short uh, bulbar uh, dorsal incision and then see how long and how tight the stricture is. If it's very short, we might just do a Heineke Michelet stricturoplasty. If it's very obliterative, we might be inclined to do what we call a mucosectomy, which is what you see pictured here where they've removed this segment of mucosa and then they've sewn the back walls, which is really the ventral wall, back together and then you close the dorsal walls. And if it's longer, I'll do a graft. So it's not as important to know exactly how long the stricture is uh, before I proceed with urethroplasty. Uh, you know, there used to be a day and age where if it was less than two centimeters, I would divide the urethra right up front and do an EPA. And if it was longer, I would do a buckle graft right up front. So knowing the exact length was more important, but now it's okay, at least the way I approach it, to open them up and then, and then figure it out once they're open because we haven't closed any doors by doing a dorsal urethrotomy. So that takes us to the longer bulbar strictures that are presenting for the first time. We know that longer strictures that are recurrent should get a urethroplasty because every recurrent stricture should get a or be offered a urethroplasty. But what about the longer strictures that are presenting for the first time? Uh, those should also be offered a urethroplasty. And that's based off of, uh, again, the randomized trial in the, in the 90s, which the results here in the graph show you that the longer the stricture is, the lower the success rate with endoscopic management. So once the length gets above two centimeters, the success rate long-term with endoscopic management goes down. And so surgeons should offer urethroplasty as the initial treatment for patients with long bulbar urethral strictures, given the low success rate of DVIU or dilation. And that's another reason why accurate staging is important before treatment, as long as the treatment's not urgent. Is there any evidence for whether you should put your graft dorsally or ventrally or laterally when you're doing a urethroplasty for a long bulbar stricture? There really isn't great evidence. Uh, here's a meta-analysis showing that the success rates are pretty similar, whether it's a ventral graft or a dorsal graft. Um, we actually, a, a group of about uh, 10 of us, tried to do a randomized trial of ventral versus dorsal buccal graft, but that was right around the time that this uniform dorsal approach for all strictures came along. And so, it, as with a lot of surgical trials, it just, it didn't work out because by the time we got the trial up and running, the field had kind of moved on to the next great thing, which is this uniform approach for all dorsal strictures. So I don't do ventral buckle grafts very often anymore. And it's not because there's evidence against it. It's just that I prefer a uniform approach for all the strictures. Now, what about penile strictures, which moves us down to the bottom half of this figure? Uh, so the guidelines don't have much about this bottom part that I put in there, about there being no lumen. Uh, 
Uh, so that's more based off of uh, the way a lot of people practice. Um, but the guidelines do talk about the top half, which is uh, whether it's a first time penile stricture or a recurrent stricture, it doesn't matter. Uh, dilation has low success rates uh, long term for any penile stricture. And so moving forward with urethroplasty is most important. Um, and uh, I would say probably the one exception would be someone who you know is never going to be a good candidate for urethroplasty or who just is never going to want a urethroplasty. Of course, you can offer him endoscopic management, and then you might want to offer him long-term self-dilation as a way to try and minimize the number of repeat procedures he's going to need because the success rate of your endoscopic management is going to be low and he's going to need repeat procedures. Uh, so I'll read through a couple of guideline statements here. Surgeons should offer urethroplasty to patients with penile urethral strictures because the evidence is that there's an expected high recurrence rate with endoscopic treatments. And then surgeons may reconstruct long multi-segment panurethral strictures with one stage or two stage techniques using oral mucosographs or flaps or a combination. So that's saying basically there's not a lot of great evidence. And if you've got a long stricture, you can treat it really however you want, one or two stage flap or graft. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of great evidence. I am gonna show you just pictures of a few of those techniques. Um, here's the approach that Barbagli described where you do a dorsal buckle graft, uh, penile urethroplasty, you mobilize the urethra. These days, most of us just mobilize it on one side so that we can keep the uh, perforators still attached to the spongiosum on the other side. You put the graft onto the corpora, you quilt it there, and then you sew the urethra back down onto it. Um, and uh, this is the ASOPA dorsal inlay. Not a procedure I do very often. I don't like the idea that there's two incisions in the corpus spongiosum. You make a ventral spongiotomy in that first panel there. That exposes the dorsal urethra. Then in the middle panel, you're making an incision down the middle of the urethra on the dorsal wall then you're quilting in your graft, and then you have to close it up again. So it seems to me, especially in a narrow urethra, that that's a lot of trauma to the, to the urethra and to the sponge. This is uh, Dr. Kolkarni's uh, single incision panurethroplasty. So if you think about it, if you're fixing strictures of the penile urethra and bulbar urethra at the same time, typically we would always make a perineal incision and a penile incision. Uh, Dr. Kulkarni described this approach where you uh, invaginate the penis and you can bring the whole penis out through the perineal incision and fix everything while it's all exposed all at once. Um, I, uh, I find that personally I have a hard time uh, dealing with the fossa navicularis using this approach. I find that this part up here in the middle panel uh, becomes difficult. Um, and I've also had more hematomas using this approach. Now, a lot of people love it. Personally, I still make two incisions. And so I think whatever works best for you. I would emphasize that it's really important to excise the fossa navicularis scar. So you see in this last panel here, the graft is, buccal graft gets laid in right there and it gets tunneled through here and comes out over there. But it's important before you do that, that you actually cut out a wedge of scar right here rather than just make relaxing cuts in it. Otherwise, there's no room for the graft and no good be uh, graft bed. So a few other guidelines to optimize the success of augment augmentation urethroplasty. One, you should use oral mucosa as the first choice um, versus like uh, skin. Uh, second, um, don't use allograft, xenograft, or synthetic materials except under an experimental protocol. Um, don't perform single stage tubularized urethroplasty where you just roll an entire buccal graft into a circle and add it to a segment of the urethra. And uh, don't use hair bearing skin. Uh, that takes us down to the last section here, which is those penile strictures without a good lumen. Um, and a lot of those are going to end up being two-stage procedures. Um, this is a 
two-stage erythroplasty, uh, kind of a modification of the original Johansson, where you would just make a, uh, you would use the local penile skin. A lot of us now will add buccal graft either on either side of the urethrotomy, or sometimes as shown in here on the, this patient on the right, we might replace the entire uh, penile urethra with buccal graft if there's really no good urethral plate here anyway. He, he was someone who had had multiple hypospadias repairs. His urethral plate really ended here, and then after that, it was just a very thin skin tube. So in the second stage, you'll come and make incisions out along here, just like a hypospadias repair and roll it together. Another thing that sometimes comes in handy is a sandwich graft, uh, otherwise known as a dorsal ventral graft, where you open the urethra dorsally after mobilizing it, you quilt one graft onto the corpora, and then you can put a second graft onto the uh, ventral wall of the urethra through this dorsal urethrotomy. So in this picture, your proximal urethral opening is here. You've excised some scar on the ventral wall of the urethra through a dorsal approach. You've quilted buccal graft onto the spongiosum, and then the other open end of urethra is up here. And then this is gonna get sewn down on that. Uh, lastly, uh, surgeons may offer perineal urethrostomy as a long-term treatment option to patients unwilling or unable to undergo urethroplasty. In my practice, I find that men less than 50 almost always want a urethroplasty, even if it's kind of a Hail Mary approach, like a panurethroplasty. Um, for those over 60, 65, uh, they frequently will go for a perineal urethrostomy in the middle age group. It's unclear, they'll go either way. These are not hard and fast uh, age guidelines. It's just been my observation based on what uh, patients tend to value. Uh, so this takes us to our last audience response question. You have a 58 year old man, and I should say, I don't think there's any right answer to this one. Uh, you have a 58 year old man with lichen sclerosis, neatal stenosis, an AUA symptom score of 28, a terrible quality of life and a Qmax of five. He's had no prior treatment. How would you manage this patient? And here's his retrograde urethrogram on the right, showing that his whole penile urethra and distal bulbar urethra involved, it looks to me like his mid bulbar urethra and proximal bulbar urethra are well preserved. Looks like a majority of people chose a two-stage urethroplasty followed by perineal urethrostomy and then a single-stage dorsal buccal graft. Uh, and I think any of those could be correct answers. Um, he's got a decent lumen in the penile urethra. There's no reason you couldn't do a single-stage dorsal buccal graft. It'll probably turn out to be uh, one very long graft or he might need two grafts and you have to be prepared for that. You also have to be prepared for the fact that you might not be able to get it all through a penile incision and you might have to make a perineal counter incision. So as long as you have uh, all the tools at your disposal and know how to do all of those things, you can approach it a variety of different ways. Uh, so in summary, um, stage strictures before you treat them. Uh, staging doesn't always have to be an x-ray, but often it will be. Uh, short bulbar strictures, you can treat with one DVIU dilation. Longer than that, uh, at least offer a urethroplasty. Uh, DVIU and dilation have similar efficacy. Um, any recurrent stricture or any penile stricture or any long bulbar stricture offer urethroplasty. And lastly, just remember this is a quality of life disease, not a life or death disease. So understand the patient's goals and priorities and surgery is not always the right answer. As evidenced, I think by the 
the second audience response question we put up there. A lot of people chose observation, which I think is totally reasonable. Uh, we tell patients that they might develop retention in the future, they might develop bladder stones or UTIs, but we don't know the incidence of any of those things happening. And so I try not to scare people into urethroplasty and just uh, let their own preferences guide our, our treatment. Uh, so that's the end of my slides. Don't forget to do the, um, the uh, evaluation. And I think now we open it up to questions. All right, thank you so, so much, Dr. Elliot. That was a, a great presentation uh, with lots of great pictures. Uh, we have a lot of questions, um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so going back to the beginning of your talk on your workup, um, uh, people wanted you to go over again your tips on measuring the length of the stricture, and do you ever use ultrasound? Yeah, good question. Uh, some people will put a uh, ruler on the screen when they're doing a rugby CUG. And if you don't do them often, that's really helpful. Uh, I, For me, I don't think a centimeter here or there is going to make a big difference in my approach these days. So I don't have a ruler on the screen. Um, Similarly, uh, I used to do on the table ultrasound at the time of the urethroplasty based on an article Dr. McInish had written 15 years ago, 20 years ago, showing that an ultrasound could make a difference. If you had someone with about a two and a half centimeter stricture, you might want to know if, if it's about two and a half on rug VCUG, maybe you want to see the spongiofibrosis because if it if there's spongiofibrosis that pushes it up to 3.5, then you're going to want to do a buckle graft. But as I mentioned earlier, since I've lately been approaching everybody with a dorsal urethrotomy, and I'm not having to commit up front as to transecting the urethra or making a ventral opening for a buckle graft, I can decide intra-op and I can just open the urethra and if it looks like there's a lot of spongiofibrosis, I can make a game time decision to do a buckle graft. So I haven't been doing ultrasound for the last three or four years. Um, I guess the last, the last piece of advice I'd give about rug VCUG is just make sure that I, either you do the exam or you trust the radiologist that do the exam because if the patient's not rotated obliquely enough or they're not injecting under enough pressure, you can get a lot of false measurements. Okay, um, moving on to, to DVIU, um, a, few, a few people wanted to know what your practice was regarding um, upper limit uh, length. Uh, uh, some people felt like two centimeters felt, felt, felt like um, a little uh, much um, and what would you ever use steroids uh, and what size catheter do you place after DVIU? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd agree. I, personal practice, now departing from the guidelines, personal practice for me is that it's more like one centimeter is where I would draw the limit for a DVIU, especially for trying to offer him long-term success. Some of the other predictors in that article that I referenced, uh, predictors of long-term success, besides just length, were degree of spongiofibrosis, uh, how narrow the lumen is. So if I see what looks like a thin membranous stricture with totally normal looking sponge underneath, then you can sometimes see that on cysto. That's someone I'm more likely to offer a DVIU uh, versus if it's a hard, dense, maybe even calcified stricture, then I don't think DVIU is gonna offer long-term success even if it's only one centimeter long. Um, as for um, injecting steroids, you know, I never have. Uh, for bladder neck contractures, I'll inject mitomycin C, but I've never been one to inject steroids in the anterior urethra. I just didn't believe the evidence. Um, and uh, there is that uh, the robust three randomized trial of the drug-coated balloon I mentioned. and. I, I'm the PI, so I have some conflict of interest, but I'll say that that does, uh, that's looking at dilating men without, uh, with a regular balloon versus dilating men with a balloon that's coated with paclitaxel. So maybe we'll get some more information there. Uh, as far as what size catheter I use, uh, 
Uh, I'll usually just use a, an 18 council tip catheter because that's the smallest council tip we have available at my hospital. Um, mm -hmm. I would I never use something larger than a 20 because uh, I think that once you use larger catheters, uh, the risk of the fossa navicularis uh, secondary stricture starts to go up. Okay. Um, and regarding CIC, several people wanted to know what your um, regimen is, what you tell patients to do. Um, and uh, if a patient is on CIC for a long time, does that make any future repairs more difficult? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, <coughs> pardon me, let me get a drink of water. So, uh, maybe it's just semantics, but I, I like the term self-dilation instead of CIC because CIC should be non-traumatic and you do it because of a, a neurogenic bladder or something and, and self-dilation is more traumatic. I recommend patients do start out with self-dilation <clears throat> once a day and then uh, gauge how difficult it is. If the if the catheter glides through easily and they don't feel it's, you know, stretching anything, then they can back off to every other day. And they can kind of keep doing that, seeing how traumatic they feel the dilation is. And I tell them as soon as it feels like you're causing any bleeding or, or damage, back off. I mean, I, I, you, you don't want to do it any less frequently. You want it to be frequent enough that it feels pretty atraumatic. But usually the most frequently I would be doing it would be once a day. Um, and then uh, I think you had a related question about the technique. Uh, yeah, if, um, if, if, it, if chronic, if chronic self-dilation would make a future repair more difficult. Oh, yeah. Oh, and one other thing I would point out about chronic self-dilation is all, especially in guys who I've been working with for a long time and I know that they keep shutting down and I have to keep taking them back to the clinic to redilate them, to get them back up to a decent size where they can start self-dilating again. Those guys, I'll tell them, why don't you self-dilate with, let's say, an 18 French catheter, and then here's a 16 and a 14 and a 12 also, so that when the 18 won't go in anymore, you can move down to a 16, and then when the 16 won't go in, you can move to a 14, and then you better be thinking about calling me to get an office appointment so that we can stretch it back up again. Um, and then as far as... Uh, effect on long-term success rate. Uh, there's some evidence about this uh, from Dr. Barbagli's group that it didn't change the long-term success of urethroplasty, but I would say that I think it frequently will push me to put in a graft because I don't know if the stricture is really just limited to that one area anymore or whether there's been some long-term damage to the urethra on either side of the main structure. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know if you, in your practice, do you find that younger patients opt more frequently for endoscopic procedures over urethroplasty because of the risk of losing ejaculation? And if so, how do you counsel them? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd say the opposite. And uh, this could be regional or country by country, but uh, in my practice, usually the young men don't want the possibility of having to do something the rest of their life, and so they go for uh, the urethroplasty. Um, I, indeed, people can have some weak ejaculation, and I can, I can count on one hand, though, maybe the 10 patients where that was a big enough concern that they uh, decided not to have a urethroplasty. Uh, and I, I do counsel everybody that they could have some weak ejaculate afterwards. Okay. Um, someone went, mentioned that at, at their institution, a reconstructive, uh, reconstruction attending uh, first balloon dilates and then does a DVIU with the thought that the balloon dilation will reveal the area of the gen stricture. Mm -hmm. um, then the DVIU will be more effective afterwards. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you do as well? It's not, I, I have to admit, I've never thought about uh, that concept of it revealing the dense part of the stricture. I think that usually they're similarly 
dense circumferentially, but I, I'd be interested to hear about a different experience. Um, usually I'll just do the DVIU. Um, I find that if I do a balloon dilation, I, I maybe I traumatize some of the urethra on either side of the stricture a little bit by dilating it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I will more frequently do a DVIU feeling like I can be more specific about where I'm uh, applying the knife. Okay. And in patients that have had repeated DVIUs, after how many DVIUs do you call it quits usually? Uh, you know, it, as with anything, it, it depends. Uh, there are some people who will DVIU for uh, five, ten times because they're elderly and a poor candidate for urethroplasty. Uh, but I've done urethroplasties in elderly people with uh, aortic valve on warfarin because each time they get a DVIU, they have a horrible bleed. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, it really depends on the specific situation. Okay. Um, a few people wanted to know if you could describe your approach to um, management of a stricture in the urgent setting, in the setting of retention, uh, dilation versus serial dilators, um, mm -hmm. the degree of dilation, et cetera, and the catheter type. Yeah. I, I mean, this is something that's changed a ton between when I was a resident and the people who are residents now. Uh, and, and mostly because of the flexible cystoscope. Not that I'm a dinosaur, but when I was a resident, it was harder to get, a, we didn't have so many flexible cystoscopes that you could easily get one up on the floor in the middle of the night. Uh, so we would still do things like filiforms and followers occasionally, uh, or blind balloon dilation. Um, but these days, I think that almost always, if you're gonna balloon, if you're going to dilate someone at the bedside, you're probably going to have a flexible cystoscope and you're going to get a wire across it. And then you're going to dilate um, either with a series of catheters over that wire uh, or uh, Goodwin sounds over that wire. Uh, I don't like using uh, Amplatz dilators because those are straight and the male urethra is really curved. Uh, so I've seen some posterior perforations with Amplatz dilators or bladder neck perforations. Uh, so it's the one thing I would recommend against. Um, I also think a suprapubic tube is totally reasonable uh, placed under ultrasound guidance uh, with some brief sedation in the emergency room. The nice thing about that is the patient's almost guaranteed to come back to your clinic to get it removed and hopefully get a stricture treated instead of if you just dilate him, he may disappear. Okay. Um, and after um, these interventions, how long do you leave the, the catheter in? I, I usually just leave it for about three days. Three days as well. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think we can move on to urethroplasty. Uh, you, might, you talked about urethral rest with suprapubic tube. Is that something that you do in, in your practice? Usually not. The only times I'll place a suprapubic tube will be if on the rugby CUG, um, there's some impression that there's a lot of inflammation. And you'll see that because there's some extravasation of contrast into the corpus spongiosum on the rug VCUG. Um, uh, or the other time I'll place a suprapubic tube is if I can't measure the true length of the stricture. Uh, so, you know, you do a rug and no contrast or very little contrast goes through the stricture. So you only know the distal extent and you don't know the proximal extent, then I might place a suprapubic tube to get a better assessment of the proximal extent to, by following it up with a VCUG later. Okay. Um, and then intraoperatively before your urethroplasty, do you routinely um, perform cystoscopy? Uh, any other methods? Do you use methylene blue, for instance, to restage the stricture? Um, so I will, so, so what I do and what I would recommend uh, when you're starting out might be different. Um, what I'll typically do is put a red rubber catheter down, 20 French, uh, cut on the tip of the catheter, and uh, that's where the stricture is. Uh, but sometimes you get it wrong. Maybe you don't have enough lube on the catheter and it stops short of the stricture or, 
maybe you push too hard and you burst through the stricture. Uh, and I've definitely been in that situation. So a safer, although slightly slower approach is to do a flex cisto and then put a, a guide wire across the stricture and then cut close to the light that you're seeing on the, uh, on the flex cisto. And having something across the stricture is probably a good technique for your first 50 or 100 urethroplasties because occasionally you'll open on the tip of the catheter and then you'll lose the lumen, especially in the center of the stricture. And then you'll have a hard time finding it again at the proximal end. Okay. Um, for uh, proximal dorsal grafts, do you use suture the buccal graft um, for backing um, to the corpora or not at all? Uh, for very proximal buccal grafts, we're talking in the when it's getting basically down to the area of the sphincter, uh, I would imagine they're asking. I, I do quilt the buccal graft, even if I'm quilting it onto the sphincter or the other fibers, whatever they are back there, proximal to the splitting of the corpora, I will quilt it down wherever I can, yeah. Okay, uh, and you mentioned um, that uh, for a dorsal approach, um, uh, in your urethroplasties, you can make an intraoperative decision, stricture plasty versus mucosectomy versus buccal mucosal graft. Can you do the same with a ventral approach? You know, it's harder, um, at, at least in terms of uh, if you're going to do a Heineke Michelitz, I think it's pretty difficult to do that ventrally. I don't know that anyone's described doing it that way. It's, it's a lot bloodier if you open ventrally. Uh, so in general, I would say that if you open ventrally, you're kind of committing to a ventral buccal graft. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know if you harvested your own uh, buccal grafts. Do you have ENT do it? I harvest my own. Uh, and um, what, one nice thing about that is that you don't always know whether you're going to need one or not. And so it gives you the flexibility to harvest it when and if you need it and not, not bug your colleagues if you decide not to use it at the last minute. Okay. Um, is there a role for uh, using a graft for a bulbar stricture due to, due to a traumatic straddle injury? No. Um, you want to think, so the straddle injuries are always going to be uh, either completely crushed and dead urethra or uh, separated urethra, kind of like avulsed, if you will. Um, and so even if the stricture is three centimeters, three and a half centimeters long, you want to think of it as a, a disruption and not as a stricture because there's really no healthy spongiosum underneath uh, to graft onto. So uh, I'm sure you could find the rare exception where I might use a graft, but I can't think of ever using a graft in someone where I knew it was a true straddle injury with an acute stricture happening afterwards. And those people you, you know, you, you never want to say always, but pretty much always are going to excise the full length of the stricture and do an EPA, a classic EPA, not a non-transecting, but a true transecting EPA to get rid of all the dead sponge. Okay, um, and how do you follow these patients uh, in your clinic postoperatively? Do you do PVRs, uh, Euroflow, cystoscopies? Yeah, um, I will typically do a uh, avoiding cystiurethrogram uh, about two and a half weeks after surgery. So we fill their bladder with contrast, take out the catheter, have them void, make sure there's no leak. If there's a leak, we'll put the catheter back in and bring them back two to four weeks later for another attempt. Long-term, I'll follow them at three months with a cysto, Euroflow, and questionnaires. And then uh, if I can get them to come back at one year, I'll do the same thing at one year. And then after that, I'll usually release them to following up remotely. So we get the, them to sign a consent form such that we can send questionnaires to them by email and they fill, fill them out that way. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know if you could give any tips for a perineal urethrostomy. 
Yeah, I'd say the big tip is to never make, so I, I do like the idea of using a U-flap. Um, and if you use a U-flap, just make sure that you make it anterior enough. That is almost on the back side of the scrotum. Don't worry about the fact that there's some hair growing on that piece of the tip of that U that you're gonna uh, flap down in. Um, that, 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 oh, sorry, I messed up the slide there. That, that doesn't matter. Um, the key is to have mobile skin that can reach down to the proximal end of your urethrostomy. The big error is when people make the base of the U be down by the, um, the ischial tuberosities on either side of the anus and then the tip of the U is not distal enough, and that's very non-mobile skin. And uh, not only might it have a hard time reaching down to the proximal extent of the stricture, but then also when you close up the sides of what the kind of the two proximal arms of it, when you sew skin to skin there, it's under a lot of tension and that can dehiss. So make a very floppy, very distal U flap. Okay, um, and similarly, uh, some people wanted to know if you could uh, give some tips for DVIU, where exactly uh, do you cut? Uh, not evidence-based, but I make three or four radial cuts, um, kind of at 10 o'clock, two o'clock, four and eight o'clock. Um, and I'll make more cuts if it's not opening up after I do that. Okay, great. Um, uh, also more surgical tips um, uh, for balloon dilation. Um, how do you like uh, doing that? Uh, I like to put in a flexible cystoscope, get a wire across the stricture into the bladder. If I can have x-ray to confirm the wire placement, I will. And then remove the flexible cystoscope, leaving the guide wire in place place the scope alongside the wire uh, so I can look at the stricture and then advance the balloon over the wire and with cystoscopy confirm that it's in the right location. Again, if we have fluoro, we can confirm that the proximal end of the balloon is in the right location also and then inflate it while we watch using cysto. I think it helps to even keep the scope in there while you're keeping the balloon inflated because sometimes these will migrate and that way you can keep an eye on things and make sure it's not slipping. Um, and do you, do you also believe that DVIU only works if you cut down all the way to bleeding tissue? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, have you ever um, heard of systemic steroids um, to decrease the recurrence rate of urethral strictures after treatment? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, oh, and uh, one last question that uh, just popped up. For, for long bulbar strictures due to straddle injury, is there any role for fasciocutaneous penile skin flap? Um, you know, some people have done fasciocutaneous skin flap even as a tube for, say, bulbar necrosis after pelvic fracture urethral injury. That'd be the closest thing I could get to. Uh, I wouldn't use it for just a bulbar straddle injury. Those, you can always get the two ends to reach again. But there is the occasional situation where you have a pelvic fracture urethral injury, and then uh, they've, um, there's been so much damage to the vessels down there that even the whole bulbar urethra is all necrosed. So now you're dealing with a long gap from the pelvic fracture membranous disruption and you don't have any bulbar urethra. There's a situation where you would consider doing some type of a tube flap using fasciocutaneous skin flap. Okay, well, I think we answered all of our questions actually. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank uh, you. That was, that was great. Um, if, just reminding everybody to go fill out the, uh, the survey um, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much, Dr. Elliott. Thank you, Claire.